What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Lights Out. Today, we are diving into a highly requested topic, sleep paralysis, and this idea of sleep paralysis demons, as many people have encountered. There is this strange realm that exists between deep sleep and being awake. But in this realm, sleepers have witnessed horrors so terrifying they could only exist in the deepest, darkest nightmares. She's been nicknamed the Old Hag, or the Night Hag. One of the earliest known sleep paralysis demons, though, is known as Lilithu, or sometimes she's called Lilith in English. Some people even believe that the Hat Man or other sleep paralysis demons might actually be extraterrestrials or interdimensional beings. If you're lucky, the paralysis will end before the shadow person can snatch you right out of your bed. Have any of you ever experienced sleep paralysis? What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Lights Out. I'm your host, Josh. In the studio, I'm joined by my boys, Austin. What's up, man? Yo, how's it going? I'm doing all right. And Daniel, the producer. What's up, man? What's up, guys? Today, we are diving into a highly requested topic for a long time. One that is very, very mysterious because we don't understand it at all. And science is continuing to try and figure it out, but... I don't think we're getting any closer to figuring out this phenomenon and that is sleep paralysis and this idea of sleep paralysis demons as many people have encountered during their sleep paralysis uh, adventures i guess I, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing but have any of you ever experienced sleep paralysis i personally have not i haven't either thank god yeah it sounds like a terrifying experience you just have insomnia yeah if the, yeah, I did not sleep at all last night. Just a heads up. So if I'm a little slow today, slower than normal, uh, just just forgive me, please. Or don't. Or don't. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel, have you? I think you've said you've experienced sleep paralysis before, right? Yes, I actually have. I experienced it actually through for a couple of years when I was younger, between the ages of like 14 and like 19. I experienced the same kind of demon, uh, demon over the course of those years and it was always the same one i think we talked about it before it was like it looked like that uh that one woman from are you afraid of the dark oh yeah you know the one yeah. with, like, with, uh, with no eyes and it's all decrepit yeah it was that and i would always feel this heavy pressure on my chest and i would always be lying in my bed and i would hear her coming up the stairs to my room but i wouldn't be able to move i would just be locked in fear and it's terrifying and if any of you out there have experienced that i'm sorry it's it's not fun <laughs> and then you had to like go to school the next day yeah but go to school the next day and yeah. just act like everything's fine uh, were you able to actually go back to sleep though or after the episode would conclude or it just how long would it go on for to be honest with you i don't really know time wise what would happen because i it didn't feel real like i would i would i would uh i'd be sleeping and then i would wake up but i'd still be asleep and then i would actually wake up in a panic you know sweating all that stuff i'd eventually be able to go back to sleep in like an hour and a half or so after calming down but it was never a good night's sleep and i kind of felt like how austin feels right now <laughs> and you would be able to fully remember this too like the next day i mean i'd be able to feel uh, not mm, i'd be able to remember mostly the last bit of it like i remember i even to this day i still remember hearing like her voice coming up the stairs Jeez. i remember the the uh the scratching on the wall and then I remember specifically her like floating above me oh while I'm God. just lying in bed staring at the ceiling. So there's there's still images I remember because it was reoccurring. It happened like six or seven times. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting too that you encounter the same entity, whatever it is, comes and visits you. Uh, you know, sometimes people might say I'm cursed, but I, I don't know. It was, <laughs> <laughs> You're definitely it was interesting. Well, that's did what, you, yeah. Uh, did you ever like have sleeping problems? Um, like any diagnosed sleeping issues, like sleep apnea yeah. or no, no sleeping issues, insomnia or nothing like that. Just yeah, just bad dreams. Or just, <laughs> damn. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, the worst that I've experienced is night terrors, which is a little bit different. There's there's no entity involved, thank God. But I have there. I was probably late late teens, seventeen to probably twenty. 21 22 i had a 
bad fit of night terrors, which if you're not familiar with that, it, it is like a sleep disorder as well. And the difference is, is that you wake up suddenly. Sometimes you're shouting or screaming. So sometimes I'd be like whimpering or I'd be like, I, I would full on like go, ah, and then I would like, jump out of bed and like just be panicked and 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 like looking around I'll, I'll never forget there was one time i woke up in the middle of the night and i jumped out of bed and i like ran over to the window and i had like i was like oh there's gunshots there's gunshots and there was there was no gunshots but i was like so convinced that there was i heard it yeah yeah and um that's Kendall did not hear that it. That it can be so real and vivid like but that. But I was like, for sure. I was so panicked. I was like, where are they? Where are they? Oh, man. Maybe I should count my blessings that I didn't sleep at all last night. <laughs> Maybe I'm not complaining, man. Yeah. Tossing and turning is better than the better night than, terrors. Than just being, because the thing about it is you're just filled with dread and you're, you're absolutely terrified. Your heart's racing. Sometimes I'd wake up sweating. Um, there was, the only time I ever feel like I may have seen something was another night i woke up and this i don't know this potentially could have been a sleep paralysis episode i'm not sure because i don't remember necessarily feeling a pressure on my chest because that's a pretty common um symptom i guess and all i remember is i woke up it was pitch dark and i looked up at the ceiling and there was this almost like spider looking thing that was just descending from the ceiling damn and, and i just remember like staring at it and just being absolutely terrified of it and i, I think I, I i can't remember if i got up after um but i i know i was just kind of frozen there looking at it and then i like rolled over and i was like did i told kendall i'm like did you see that you see that thing and she was like what are you talking about like there's oh, there's nothing there terrifying but it was like something black shadowy like it, it reminded me of a spider because it kind of had like looked like it had legs to it and it was just like coming down from the ceiling and i oh, was like man so i don't know maybe that was sleep paralysis yeah, possibly i mean it sounds pretty similar to what i experienced so yeah. I, but yeah i was like it just terrified me and then it was, it's weird like i got to my my mid-20s and all of a sudden the night terrors went away and nightmares just really in general went away and the the waking up kind of you know, shouting or screaming went away. Would thank God because it was horrible. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's interesting to kind of unpack like what what that is and what are the theories behind it, which we'll, which we'll get into. But today we're not only going to be talking about sleep paralysis experiences, but also this idea of the sleep paralysis demon, which you know, there's there's a lot of theories, both scientific and even spiritual. Of like, is it's you know, are you kind of melding with? you know, the other side, this other supernatural realm when you're having these experiences with these sleep paralysis demons and kind of taking a look at where it all originates from because I think it's one, I mean, sleeping and dreaming is just such an interesting thing to think about and the fact that we don't fully understand what dreaming even is, you know, like we are trying to understand it via science and neuroscience and things like that, but, you know, scientists can't pinpoint where does it originate from what it is and why yeah like, why do we dream why do we have these sleep disorders why do we have these encounters with shadowy beings and sleep demons and uh it's it's terrifying stuff honestly and i know a lot of you out there have had firsthand experiences with the sleep paralysis demon so with that being said let's just go ahead and dive right in so as we all know there is this strange realm that exists between deep sleep and being awake. You know, there's different REM stages, and which is very interesting to me because if you don't really know that, you just think, oh, I close my eyes, I go to sleep, but your brain's actually going through different stages of sleep. And, you know, they all have different impacts on your consciousness in many ways. But in this realm, sleepers have witnessed horror so terrifying they could only exist in the deepest, darkest nightmares. What's worse is that while this terror creeps in, you're just trapped in your own body. And most, all you can do is just look around the room. If being paralyzed wasn't scary enough, you might also witness demons, witches, vampires, or shadow people. Sometimes they're directly on top of you, trying to choke you to death. But where do these entities come from? Are they even real? 
or is it just your mind playing tricks on you, hallucinating? And why are the same kinds of sleep paralysis demons experienced across the world? So there is a lot to unpack with sleep paralysis. I'll try and give you another crash course, but I have segmented a lot of the science. And uh, to be honest, a lot of the neuroscience that I was reading about goes way over my head because yeah. they're dealing with like specific neurotransmitters and stuff like that. So I'll try and keep it to just the core concepts here just to get the general gist of things. But if you are interested, we'll throw some links uh, for some of the sources I was looking at. If you know more about neuroscience than I do and you're curious about it, you can go check them out. But some research shows that around 7 to 20% of people have experienced isolated sleep paralysis, which means that they've experienced it without having signs of a previous sleep disorder. Other sources say that somewhere around 30 to 50% of people will experience it at least once in their life. So wow. I don't I don't like those stats that I might still That's experience a pretty it. Pretty good chance that all of us are going to experience it, right? Or you've already experienced it. Yeah. I may have, but certainly not as bad as some people. Yeah. Supposedly it's much more common to experience sleep paralysis if you have a sleeping condition, especially narcolepsy. I know the percentage is way higher if you suffer from narcolepsy. Uh, many also believe that sleep apnea plays into the sleep paralysis experience. We'll get into that a little bit later, but it has, you know, how you a lot of people feel like they're suffocating or there's something on their chest they can't breathe. Could be a s think it symptom of the sleep apnea. Sleep, yeah, exactly. But to break it down, here's how Cleveland Clinic defines sleep paralysis. I'll just read it verbatim what they say. Quote, while falling asleep or waking up, your brain sends signals that relax muscles in your arms and legs. The result, which is called muscle atonia, helps you remain still during rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep. With sleep paralysis, you regain awareness, but you still can't move. It's actually a good thing. It's meant to keep you still while dreaming, which is you don't want to be moving. Uh, think about sleepwalking and how strange that gets. That's actually in a different part, a different stage of non-REM sleep. But if you think about that, you should be paralyzed. Like you kind of wish you were paralyzed because people have done crazy shit while it's sleepwalking. You probably heard. I'll list off some of the craziest stuff that's been reported. Some people have cooked three course meals, urinated in their closets, let strangers into their house, jumped out of windows, eaten full sticks of butter, gone on shopping sprees that cost thousands of dollars. All in a sleep? <laughs> yeah, sleepwalking. What? Sleepwalking. Wow. Yeah. Gone outside and froze to death in the winter, which is awful. Yeah. Mowed the lawn, climbed a construction crane, had sex with strangers, and supposedly even committed murder. Wow. So it's a all in all, this is a very good thing that our body paralyzes us during sleep. We don't want to be moving. Or even just, I mean, think about your partner being disturbed, you know, throwing punches at the demon or something. <laughs> yeah, you might be hitting be someone bad. next to you, right? That so, would be bad. Yeah, or if your partner turned into the demon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? and, yeah, which some people which, do yeah. think that, yeah, maybe it's just, just someone in the room, but you're still in that REM state where you're thinking that that demon is not really Real. there. Yeah. yeah. So you're basically in a pseudo dreamlike state as they say your body might have tried to kick you out of dreaming but you're trapped in this in-between realm you're aware of your surroundings but you can't move which freaks you out even more and this paralysis can last for just a few seconds or sometimes people experience it for several minutes good god this reminds me of the sunken place from yeah get out for real it's just like paralyzed there and oh it's exactly terrifying exactly like that yeah that's so, that's interesting though because i'm I'm thinking to some of the nightmares i've had and in most of my nightmares i am not still i'm actively moving in my nightmare because yeah. i'm generally running from something um people creatures i mean whatever it may be but very rarely am i like stuck and not unable to move in in my my dream yeah which is like you would say is a good thing, right? Right. Yeah. yeah absolutely. You can run. Absolutely. Yeah. So imagine not being able to run or scream or anything. Nobody right? wants to die in their sleep, right? But yeah. Right. That's that's terrifying too. No, thank you. Many people experience hypnopompic hallucinations. It's actually the opposite of you. Maybe I think it's pronounced hypnagogic, 
it's where that's where you're falling asleep. Hypnopompic is where you're you're waking up and you might experience some hallucinations. Uh, I know some of the greats, I, maybe it was like Leonardo da Vinci or something, would take these moments as inspiration for like his ideas. Like either he's falling into a dream or he's coming out of one or something, and he'll be like, I thought of a helicopter. So he'll quickly go jot down notes. Uh, that's where like some of people have been inspired in these totally. states because yeah. they're having these crazy hallucinations. So you're basically, some people think that this is what's happening while you're still your muscle atonia is still there and you're you're paralyzed right these include chest pressure hallucinations intruder hallucinations and and or vestibular motor hallucinations which is like out of body experiences cuz you could potentially be experiencing these all at once wow which is terrifying it's just wild to think about how many different types of of, of dreaming experiences you can have i mean both good and bad i mean you have the the whole idea of lucid dreams and a lot of people experience you know waking up in their dream and having control over it and you know that happens in in different stages of REM sleep as well it's just like, like there's such a spectrum of of different experiences you can have while you're dreaming and yeah. while you're sleeping some people some of the studies i don't know how verified they were but some people said that if you're more likely to be able to lucid dream you're more prone to sleep paralysis episodes. That's interesting. Yeah, that's a theory. It, it makes sense though, because it's kind of, in a way, it's it's similar because you it, during sleep paralysis you feel like you're what you're experiencing is real. Yeah, and, your awareness. And you're awake. Yeah, you, you're awake in the sense that you understand everything that's going on, and the only difference is, is that you don't really have control over the right. narrative of, that's going to play out. Right? Yeah, that's so, true. <laughs> The big that's, difference, that's yeah, pretty, pretty terrifying. Yeah, it just makes me think too. Like, we have all these different experiences that we can have in the dream state and while we we sleep every night, and yet during the day, you know, without the the help of substances or you know, if you, I, I guess, through meditation, you can achieve altered states of consciousness sometimes. But we we only perceive reality from this this conscious you know awake perspective and but while we sleep we get all we have this whole spectrum of experiences that we can have i always wonder why that is or if perhaps we just don't know how to tap into these other states of awareness while we're you know awake so to speak yeah it's i mean i always weird. think of it that it's kind of our unconscious trying to talk to us tell us things or something maybe that's been bothering us but it's told to us in like a crazy metaphor through our dream state something like that as as far as sleep paralysis goes it's hard for me to say because i haven't experienced it myself but i do know that a lot of people's physical experience is playing into what they're hallucinating or, or potentially what's happening to them um, like i was saying like sleep apnea is that's what's playing into why you can't breathe or is your state of paralysis, which we'll get into a little bit later in the episode, is that doing something to where, you know, you ever heard of like a phantom limb? Yeah, yeah. So like, is it the fact that you can't move? Are you kind of projecting your own body across the room, which will, I'll, I'll drop Weird. into that a little later, but yeah, there's yeah. a lot of theories out there, but I don't think anyone's really pinned it down. Yeah, it's such a wild phenomenon honestly yeah and sleep paralysis is something that's been experienced all across the world it's not like it's just isolated to a single geological location i mean pretty much all humans have the ability to experience this terrifying form of of dreaming and for some the sleep paralysis demon is a faceless shapeless presence they might look like shadows or they might float in the air above you others crawl on all fours and attack your chest and neck or some stand perfectly still at the edge of your bed i don't know what's more terrifying out of those three options <laughs> having something hover above you in the air <laughs> crawling on all fours attacking you so basically being on top of you or just having some shadowy figure standing at, still at the edge of your bed it's wild that none of the sleep paralysis experiences are a positive one they're no. all terrifying right no no <laughs> doesn't that say a lot too yeah that's what's interesting too it's not like you're uh, you know you're you're in this state of paralysis but this beautiful angelic being is there and it's like hello yeah you know 
you know, giving you condolences and compliments and pumping you up for the next day. <laughs> yeah, right. I wish. That'd be I'm nice. your guardian angel and I'm here to tell you you're on the right track, bud. <laughs> nope. It's what scares you the most? Yeah. Let's do that. Some sleepers have even witnessed characters from horror movies or books like like Daniel over there. Like some people see the girl from the ring, which yikes. That that would be a scary uh, manifestation to have in your bedroom at night. No, thank you. Others might be visited by more than one entity, like a group of shadows or a swarm of spiders crawling on their face, which that makes me think that that one experience I had was potentially um, some type of sleep paralysis. Because again, I, I really feel like it was a spider-like shadow figure that was descending the descriptions of sleep paralysis demons constantly change though, but many have experienced the same unique entities all across the world. And one of the most common entities that people see during sleep paralysis is a terrifying woman who eats children. She's been nicknamed the old hag or the night hag. In Italy, she's been called Panda Feque. In Brazilian folklore, she's known as the Pisadera. She's the personification of nightmares and has a strong connection to sleep paralysis. It's said she waits on people's rooftops while people share big family dinners. She watches through the windows undetected and she waits for everyone to go nighty night. People have experienced her terror say it starts with a simple feeling late at night, right as they open their eyes. It's a feeling that you're being watched from somewhere in the room. Your body is now a prison. As you lie in bed unable to move, the hairs on your neck stand up. A nasty smell fills the room as a sound of footsteps draws near. The room is pitch black and you can only see her figure when she's nearly on top of you. And the first thing you notice is her dull red eyes. The rest of her face is hidden beneath a large hood. She raises her hands and you see her long fingers reach toward you. They're so chapped and dry that flakes of dead skin begin to fall off. She moves closer and you begin to see her face when she's just within inches of you and a long crooked nose sticks out from beneath the hood. As she smiles, you see her pointed teeth are green and decaying. She somehow sharpened her teeth, so it's much easier to consume young children raw. She then puts a foot on your chest or just sits on you, shifting her weight so it's hard to breathe. No matter how hard you try, you can't move or scream for help. Her weight crushes you as you gasp for air but as the terror rises, you're suddenly released. You can breathe and move again and the room is empty. If there's one thing that's comforting about the experience is that you're not alone. The old hag has crossed many paths during sleep paralysis all over the world. In New Finland, she's known as Agrog and her sightings were once so common that the locals would say things like, I was hagged last night. They also believed that they could summon the hag by reciting the Lord's prayer backward right before bed. To protect themselves, they would hammer sharp nails through a board and sleep on their backs with the board resting on their chest with the nails facing upward. So if the hag tried to put her foot up or sit on them, these nails would stab her. Pretty terrifying one. Also kind of reminds me of Daniel's experience. Yeah, I was going to say, bit, maybe right? it's a, the old hag you're seeing. Oh, maybe. I mean, I definitely did experience that, that crushing weight where it feels like you're almost going to uh, pass out like you almost feel like you're gonna choke to death. Uh, that that's actually what I woke so up. Like, <gasps> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like um, almost like gasping for air. Yeah, you're gasping for air, and then I remember I would wake up when I would feel like I would I was about to die. Oh wow. Um, and then I would just wake up gasping for air, sweating the whole nine yards. I was never screaming though. Right. I think that's like the key to a sleep paralysis experience is you're not able to let out any noise yourself because. Yes. You're having trouble breathing. Yes. Right? I remember trying to scream and nothing would come out. And actually it felt like every time I would try to scream, I would just lose more air. Like it was getting sucked out of me. Wow. So all you can do is just ride it out. Yeah. Just say a quick <laughs> prayer. The best. Start yeah. saying prayers in your head. <laughs> Deliver me from this evil, <laughs> please. A big thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring today's episode. I've always been a huge fan of VPN services and I've tried many of them out there on the market, but I gotta say Surfshark is so much more than just a VPN service. They also have a number of other cybersecurity features that you can add on to your VPN service to fully protect you 
wherever you are. They've got Surfshark Alert, which actually monitors your personal data, which is very important these days. They have antivirus software, which everybody should have on their laptop or computer. And they also have Surfshark Search, which allows you to browse the internet without a trace, avoid personalized ads, and hide from search engines, which are all super important these days. I was just traveling actually in Lake Tahoe. I was on the Nevada side and Surfshark really came in handy because Nevada outlaws fantasy football, especially when your money's involved. So I was all worried that I wasn't gonna be able to tune into my draft while I was gone, but all I had to do was fire up Surfshark and boom, I got connected and I was able to get around the blocks from that Nevada IP address. Plus when you connect to a VPN, it encrypts all of your data, basically creates a tunnel to the internet. Surfshark is also great for unlocking more content on your streaming services. You can connect to a different server from a different country. And once you get connected to that VPN server and boom, you get access to say, you know, Canadian library or you're in Europe, you get the UK's library and all of the content that they see. So if you're not using a VPN service yet, what are you waiting for? Get started with Surfshark today. They offer a 30 day money back guarantee. So there's no risk in even just trying it out to see what it can do for yourself. And what's cool is Surfshark is offering our audience an exclusive offer by just entering promo code lights out for an extra three months free at surfshark.deals slash lights out. Again, get an extra three months for free with Surfshark with promo code lights out at surfshark.deals slash lights out. So the sleep paralysis experience, much like the old hag, actually has roots in the word itself of nightmare which is crazy and the the word nightmare itself might actually come from these experiences through the centuries many have experienced entities pressing on their chests like daniel was just saying the term mare actually comes from old english it's tied to a mythological demon or goblin who torments someone with frightening dreams it's about as simple mm. as that in germanic and slavic folklore this mare would sit on people's chests as they slept which would cause terrifying nightmares Going back even further, Old Norse used the word Mara, which is very similar to Mare. These were nightmares conjured by the sorceress Hold. The Chinese called sleep paralysis. Also, forgive me going forward, I have a lot of pronunciations coming up, so if I mispronounce something, I apologize. The Chinese called sleep paralysis Guiya, or ghost pressure, and believed that a ghost sat on the sleeper. In the West Indies, it was called Kokma, and meant a baby ghost jump on the sleeper's chest and attack their throat. In Japan, they called it kanashibari, which roughly translates to bound in metal. And some in Japan believe the sleep paralysis is actually caused by the yokai, which are shape-shifting spirits that possess their victims in the dead of night. If we go over to Nigeria, they call it the ogun oru, which means nocturnal warfare. I think that's my favorite one of of them Damn, all. that's a crazy term, nocturnal yeah. warfare. And in Arab-speaking cultures, it's known as jathum, which translates to what sits heavily on something. And others believe the jinn demon is at play with those. One of the earliest known sleep paralysis demons, though, is known as Lilithu, or sometimes she's called Lilith in English, and she dates all the way back to Mesopotamia, our favorite place, oh, where yeah. so many legends. Where it all originates. Yeah. Right. Yep. Her name roughly translates to night monster or of the night. She's a nightmare succubus that dates back all the way to 2400 BCE. And she targets children, which is very similar to the hag. And uh, she also supposedly targets women in childbirth. Even though the legends date back that far, it wasn't until 1664 where we actually had a first clinical recording of it. And it was uh, a Dutch case. And it was a 50 year old patient who described a devil lying on her chest. So you can kind of see even dating just all the way back with all these different terms and everything. A lot of it has to do with chest pressure being bound, something, some weird entity sitting on your chest. Like they're all the same for the past hundreds and hundreds of years. Right. And it all pretty much stems back to demonic spirits. Yeah. Right. They're always connected. Yeah. yeah. In 1781, the earliest depiction of a sleep paralysis demon can be seen in the famous painting by Henry Fuseli called The Nightmare. In this, you know, you should take a look um, if you're not watching on YouTube. Oh yeah, I've seen YouTube. this, this yeah, pic it's, before. It's a legendary picture. Uh, a woman is seen sleeping in a nightgown and she appears she's in a very deep dream. 
uh, and she looks ape, dead. Yeah, honestly, yeah. An ape-like incubus is seen sitting on her chest, and we've covered an incubus before. It's basically the counterpart to a succubus. It's a demon that preys on women while they sleep. And I want to say shout out to the DIA, the Detroit Institute of Arts. This is actually where the painting is located today. I think it's in the era of revolution. Oh, section, really? That's cool. If you ever get out to Detroit, highly recommend checking out the DIA. There is so many paintings in there and artwork. You can't see everything in a day and they just have stuff from all over the world. Um, but yeah, that is the first ever depiction of what we think is a sleep paralysis demon, which is pretty wild. Yeah, that's actually a pretty dope painting right there. Yeah. I worry about that woman waking up with her head at, you know, the size of a balloon from all the blood <laughs> flowing to her head. Yeah. Like, good God. Also, what's that horse up to? Yeah, what? Just Did the out. demon ride in on the horse? Or, <laughs> or is that just her horse that sleeps with her? Yeah. Many historical accounts of sleep demons come from mythology, and few try to give explanations for why we actually experience them. Some of the most terrifying experiences during sleep paralysis are ones where the sleeper sees a dead relative looming in their bedroom. And this might be from our access to the spirit realm when we sleep. Some of the Inuit people of Baffin Island, Canada have their own interpretations. In their shamanistic cosmology, the person's soul is the most vulnerable during sleep. The paralysis is the result of an attack by shamans or malevolent spirits. In traditional Inuit beliefs, we're all comprised of three souls. The breath soul animates the body and disappears in death. The name soul, which is carried through someone's name. And the tarnik, which is indestructible and floats within the body, but can also exist without the body. The tarnik can act as a vulnerability or as protection, and these souls are potentially open to evil shamans who exist in the spirit world and are invisible to non-shamans. And they can also connect the living to the spirit world and the world of the dead. Some Inuit elders believe that sleep is a state where one could contact these worlds. In 1929, an Inuit elder once said, when a man sleep sleeps, his soul is turned upside down so that the soul hangs head downwards, only clinging to the body by its big toe. For this reason, we believe that death and sleep are nearly allied, for otherwise the soul would not be held by so frail a bond when we sleep. They also believe that during sleep, our souls are the source of our dreams, and through the eyes of our soul, we could witness the other side. Many during sleep paralysis have seen their dead relatives, and in the Inuit culture on Baffin Island, a deceased relative's name soul might appear during sleep paralysis. This would be a sign to pass on the name soul to their new infants, and so these names are carried on for generations to come. But sometimes meeting a dead relative in a state of sleep paralysis isn't just a namesake. Outside of Inuit mythology, it might also mean that death is right around the corner and your ancestors are calling you to the afterlife, especially if it happens more than once. In one sleeper's experience, a mass demon with long, sharp fingernails approached his bedside. It then reached into a large bag and pulled out the sleeper's relatives. And one by one, the demon slit each of their throats with its long, jagged fingernails. And when the demon was done, it reached out to the sleeper's head and began stroking his hair with its bloody fingers. And then he woke up. Some sleepers experience terrors like this and might feel like a threat or a reminder that death can come for anyone at any moment. But it also might be a sign of revenge from the grave. In a strange case in the late 1970s and 80s, dozens of Southeast Asian refugees in America suddenly died from unknown causes during their sleep. They were all men in their 20s and 30s from the Hmong ethnic group. So many died that it began to alarm public health experts. The victims were usually refugees from Laos. They were persecuted in their country after being recruited by the CIA to fight the North Vietnamese in the Vietnam War. Around 30,000 of them fought in the Northern Highlands and they died at a rate 10 times higher than American soldiers. After the end of the war in 1975, the Hmong men were seen as traitors by their country, so they became refugees in Thailand and the United States. After they resettled, many suffered from PTSD and many lived in poverty. Soon, many of them began dying at alarming numbers in their sleep. Between 1981 and 1987, 117 refugees died this way, and investigators found no medical explanation for their deaths. Some community members try to connect the deaths to chemical nerve agents that were used during the war, 
but doctors didn't support this theory since there was no evidence to back it up. Plus, if it was nerve gas, why was it only affecting males, and why only at night while they slept? Some suggested it might have been a cardiovascular problem related to stress from their journey as refugees, but many Hmong refugees believe that the deaths were actually caused by spirits of their ancestors for leaving their homeland because they became disconnected from their land and their ancestral rituals. So these spirits were out for revenge. So a lot of people thought that they were experiencing a form of sleep paralysis. They saw their ancestors during this and then they died, which is terrifying. The ailment was later classified as sons or sudden unexplained nocturnal death syndrome. And it went unexplained for I think roughly 10 to 20 years after it really started to become a problem. It's now called Brugada syndrome, and they finally figured out what it was in the 1990s. It's basically a genetic disorder where the heart's electrical system misfires. But even with that explanation, it's still terrifying. These young men were just, it's just your heart switches off basically while you're Weird. sleeping. Yeah. Um, and there's but, no like root cause of why that happens. They just say it's a genetic disorder. It's passed on. Shh. And yeah, you can look more into it. Brugada syndrome if you're, if you're curious about it. But many still believe that it was sleep paralysis and the spirits of their ancestors meeting them at, right before death. Modern researchers have tried to connect the dots between sleep paralysis and death. And there's a surprising amount of connections here. A recent study in 2019 tried to understand if there was a connection between near-death experiences and sleep paralysis. Yeah. Have you guys ever had a near-death experience where you see your, you know, let's say you're injured or just something's happening and you see, a lot of people see the white light or they see their family. I know uh, one of my friend's moms had a heart attack and she saw all of her ancestors wearing like gray suits walking up a hillside. Have you guys ever had wow, anything like wild. that? The closest thing that I can think of to a near death experience that I've I've had was when I was in I think I was in high school I went on a rafting trip and during this rafting trip the raft flipped and all of a sudden I was in the water and then I was underneath the raft and for I don't know 30 seconds or so I felt like I was drowning probably cuz I was because i was just getting yeah. like pushed down under the water from the raft and obviously all the rapids and stuff are not you know helping that situation and i just remember it, it was dark for a moment and then i feel like i saw a light but then i was able to push myself from out from underneath the raft and then you know come back to the surface but there was a brief time where i felt like i was kind of seeing a, a light at the end of the tunnel so to speak but I don't know if I'd really classify that as a near-death experience because I don't think I was like, hopefully I wasn't near death at yeah. that point, but it it sure was it was definitely the closest I've come to to dying at this point Damn. um in my life. Yeah. Cool. I've I've had one, I don't know, like I it's kind of similar to yours where I don't think I was near death, but I did see something. Uh I was an idiot. It was we were at recess. I think I was in middle school and we were up on the bleachers in the basketball yeah. uh, arena. And so um, I was running around in socks, which is already everything slick. <laughs> and like the bleachers were metal. So it was super slick. I was running full speed up the bleachers and across the bleachers. And I slipped and fell uh, probably a good 10 feet off the bleachers and cracked my head on the, oh, damn. On the wooden floor. Like off the side of the bleachers onto the floor? Yeah. Oh, damn. So I thought for a hot second, I was like, this is it. The crack on my head was so loud. I don't know if you've ever hit your head really hard where it's kind of deafening. But then I saw everything was black, like I had gone blind or something. I don't know what was happening. I knew I was lying there. And then, yeah, everything kind of turned white, like came into white vision. Oh, damn. And then, but then it faded. And I kind of Did you get a to, concussion from that? I don't know. <laughs> never, never <laughs> went and checked it out. It probably explains a lot, right? Yeah. What about you, Daniel? Uh, fortunately, knock on wood, I have not had a near-death experience, so I haven't experienced anything like that. Just sleep paralysis. <laughs> okay. That could be a sign of looming death, though. Yeah, Never know. true. 
Well, he keeps missing, so I... <laughs> <laughs> you keep beating it. <laughs> Just keep beating it back. So full disclosure, this study... Uh, it's not peer reviewed. It's more just interesting. Uh, near death experiences are, quote, emotional, self related, spiritual, and mystical experiences occurring in a person close to death or in a situation of imminent physical or emotional threat. So, really, you don't even have to be on the precipice of death. You can experience it outside of that as well. People who have had these experiences, they've noticed increased speed of thought. Distortion of time, perception, out-of-body experiences, and visual and auditive hallucinations, which is not that different from sleep paralysis, right? So they studied, they did a big survey of around a thousand people. They found about a hundred of them who claimed they had a near-death experience at some point in their life. And most of these people also had a history of extreme and vivid sleep disturbances, including sleep paralysis. And many had similar visions during their paralysis than they did when they had the near death experience, mm. the researchers concluded that quote, people whose brains are more likely to blend REM and waking consciousness under the right circumstances are much more likely to experience near death hallucinations, like seeing bright lights and their ancestors, which is a similar one. So I don't know. You can connect the dots however you want. If you think there is some looming death or, or maybe it's the other side trying to contact you in some way. Um, obviously it seems like they're all kind of connected though yeah i mean they're all happening in this altered state of consciousness it seems and with all that said though how much can you really nail it down with science right it is dreams they're abstract yeah. there could be something more spiritual going on there could be something supernatural going on so this is just kind of through the lens of a scientific approach but you know that doesn't really answer everything well, yeah, I mean, we don't even know where consciousness lies. Right. We don't know the source of it. Right. And so, or at least science doesn't understand the source of it. And, you know, everybody has their own explanation for where consciousness originates from. You know, some believe it's the brain, some believe it's the heart, some believe it's the soul, or the soul is your consciousness. So I think until we truly, and if we ever, I don't know that we'll ever discover the the source of our consciousness, we won't be able to understand these experiences that go along with it fully yeah so i mean i'm just thinking there's so many different i mean there's lucid dreaming there's astral projecting there's you know the ndes there's sleep paralysis and they all are this these altered states that we're our minds able to enter into without the help of of substances you know obviously if you've taken any sort of psychedelics before you can have some interesting experiences you know people have dabbled with dmt report near-death experiences and um potentially being ripped out of your body and transported to another dimension and sweet and see i know i know that's that's one i have not tried yet but and it's on the bucket list but haven't they found that when you approach death or like at the moment of death you get a dmt release isn't that has yeah. that been confirmed yeah, that's yeah. a that's a real thing all, yeah. all your body contains dmt it's in everything virtually and so when you die you release dmt which which kind of makes sense and maybe that's kind of the 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 launching point for your yeah, experience the from gateway, there yeah straight into whatever lies next yeah but like i know people who have done dmt and one of the things that they pretty much all of them say happens is you are kind of whooshed out of your body and a lot of times you have a kind of a playback of your life like your life sort of flashes before your eyes or you kind of replay through key moments before you're sort of just ripped out to this other realm where you know obviously people experience a lot of different things um, entities colors fractals all these all these different shapes and you know it's it's different for everybody but there's a there's definitely a lot of similarities but you know among people's experiences and i think i think all that's very interesting to me and, and partly why i want to to do you know that particular substance is because i feel like if there's anything that's going to give you that near-death experience guaranteed it's going to be a dmt trip <laughs> yeah. like guaranteed especially if you especially if you do enough where you you know as they say blast off then yeah you're you're leaving your body behind yeah and you're going to somewhere else and what is that you know what is that experience is it just this manifestation that your mind creates or are you actually being 
pulled into another dimension or realm. And I think that's so interesting and I want to experience it. I don't know about you, but I read this crazy book, uh, recursion, I think it's called by Blake Crouch. Um, but they basically use that DMT release to time travel. Mm. Uh, but that crazy book, uh, super fun page turner that I check. If you're interested in that, like near death DMT release type, like where can it take us? They basically learn how to utilize that. And, and I mean, essentially travel through dimensions, right? Time traveling is essentially yeah, that. Right. But yeah. I love those concepts though. Of like, what is that? Why do we get that? Where does it take us? What's the potential, you know? Yeah, totally. But another sleep paralysis entity that's become more common within the past 40 to 50 years is known as the hat man. This one is also seen in cultures all over the world. And his description is pretty consistent from one country to the next. When your eyes open after a deep dream, a tall man between six and 10 feet is looming in the corner. He's a black silhouette or sometimes a blurry outline of black mist, like a shadow person. He stands up to eight feet tall. His eyes are deep black pools and he wears a trench coat. His most recognizable feature is the hat on his head. It's flat on the top with a wide flat brim, like a bolero. Other times it looks like a fedora. He says nothing as he lurks in the room, staring at you. Sometimes he lurks in the doorway or the corner of a room. He might stare you down through a nearby mirror. The hat man then pulls out a golden watch and checks the time. He doesn't seem like he's here to attack you. Paralysis demons, he usually doesn't sit on your chest or try to choke you. He only bends his long body and leans over you, staring straight into your eyes. Some believe that invoking the name of Jesus will get him to leave. In 2001, Timothy M. Brown Jr. started the Hat Man Project where he began collecting different accounts from all over. It started after he encountered the Hat Man for the first time, not knowing what it was. In 1994, he had been living with his grandmother and great-grandmother in Nashville, Tennessee. One night, he stayed up late until about 2 a.m. The only light in his bedroom was a TV as he lay in bed, slowly falling asleep. Both doors to his room were open. One led into his grandmother's room and the other led into the hallway. At some point, he drifted off, but a noise from the TV shot him awake. And out of the corner of his eye, he saw a figure. At first, he thought it was his grandmother, but it was much taller. Its face had no distinguishable features, no eyes, nose, or mouth, only darkness. He wore a wide-brimmed hat and a long trench coat. Timothy believed that an intruder had broken into the house while they all slept and he stood in the corner of the bedroom for what seemed like an eternity. He then leaned and bent his long body toward the bedroom door and peered into his grandmother's room. He then turned his head slowly back and forth between Timothy and his sleeping grandmother. The figure then floated out into the hallway and out of sight. Once Timothy could finally move again, he jumped out of bed and sprinted into the hallway, but the figure had vanished. The next day, he told his family what had happened and he was surprised to hear that his grandmother and great-grandmother had also experienced the hat man before. Only a few nights ago, his grandmother had woken up and saw the dark figure passing through the hallway. Years later, Timothy listened to Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie, where they mentioned shadow beings, and one of the guests also talked about a dark figure in a wide-brimmed hat. Timothy realized it wasn't an isolated experience in his grandmother's house, and ever since then, he began collecting as many hat man stories as he could. To this day, he still gets about two to three stories per week, and his project is still very much active. You can go online and check out his blog. He still has running to this day, which is kind of cool. But here's another theory, which I kind of like. Others think that the Hat Man or other sleep paralysis demons are just a reworking of pop culture figures that mm. have somehow worked our way into our unconscious, similar to you know how some people experience the little girl from The Ring, like some people always think as far as the hat man goes, uh, he, he's very similar to Freddy Krueger, which is obviously a character who invades your dreams and, and kills you. Right. Um, and he has the hat and everything. So some people think is, is that just kind of the hat man realized because people noticed that it was maybe around the same time frame oh, that the hat man started to become a popular sleep paralysis demon was only kind of after those movies came out. Or you think of uh, Danny's scenario, you know, the woman, he always describes it as the woman from the book. What is it? Scary stories to tell in the dark, I yes. think is what it is. 
Yes, the one with oh, no eyes. Terrifying. Yeah, the frayed hair and everything. And I, out of all of the terrifying images from that book, that's the one that has stuck with me for so long. So I wonder, maybe it's that's just our unconscious kind of projecting things like that. Do you think that the content that we consume, especially horror content, effect, you know, affects our what we see during nightmares and potentially creates a, a larger uh, probability of experiencing sleep paralysis and these other sleep disorders? I think it's, my nightmares are weird, so I don't like... Cause I don't know. Horror movies don't scare me too much. I was going to say, have you ever had a nightmare that contained a horror movie character in it? No, but I know Same. people who ha have had that oh, experience. Really? Yeah, like people who are get really scared by horror movies, I know that for a fact they've told me like, yeah, that night after we watched that movie, it was in my dreams. So, oh, interesting. It, yeah. Yeah, a lot we, of people don't like to watch horror movies for that very reason. It's like, okay, yeah. I will have nightmares if I watch this. Yeah, for it's sure. Like, I watch it and I used to think the same thing because that's what I was told like yeah. my entire life was like, don't watch that because it'll yep. you'll end up dreaming about it and you'll have nightmares. Yeah, that's a common thing like parents tell their kids, I feel like too. Or maybe it's just like a way to get the kids to not watch yeah, the movie. Yeah, that's what I think. Is. Yeah, but I don't know. I've, I, I can't say personally because all my nightmares are weird. It's like I forgot to pay my taxes. So <laughs> the IRS is like dressed like clowns and they're armed with... <laughs> Pretty, pretty accurate, actually. Yeah, it's very strange. Yeah. The true, the true fear. <laughs> yeah, mine are often related to like real world events. Oh yeah, like I've had dreams of being, you know, out in public, and then like a terrorist attack happens. Oh god, like a bombing goes off, or you know, a shooting happens, and I'm like running and trying to escape something, or I've had. Uh, dreams of being chased by dogs that were trying to like rip me apart or like somebody trying to kill me yeah because i wonder i'm like do people who you know shelter themselves from from these things experience nightmares in the same like does everybody experience nightmares in the world or do some people is there anybody out there who's like I've never had a nightmare. I All good have, dreams for me. I would love to find a person who never had a nightmare. You're like, why? Are you just completely at peace? You've you found enlightenment yeah. or something? Do monks yeah. have nightmares? Yeah, I wonder. That's a good question. Like Buddhist monks, I mean, they're so peaceful and they're in this like state of Zen all day. Are yeah. they, do they ever have nightmares? It's a good question. Because that that was the thing. Like growing up, it'd be. You know, I'd always like say a prayer before bed, like my mom would pray for me before I go to bed. And like, she'd always be like, you know, pray for, you know, sweet dreams and yeah, you know, but then protect yourself. It's like a little bit of uh, nightmare armor that you put on. Before right. Bed. Right. And then like, you know, obviously for many years, I'd be like, before I go to sleep, I make sure I like repent all my sins from the day. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, God, for this or that. I don't want to have nightmares. I don't want to go to hell. I mean, for me, it was like I always had that looming fear of hell in my oh, yeah. head, and and it, that was pretty vivid for me. So Same. I think that impacted my my dreams more so than any horror content I ever watched. Was just the the very real reality that if I died and didn't repent my my sins, that I would be going down below for eternity for eternity yeah. where it sounded pretty pretty damn bad down there yeah mine was i was similar i have i think i still have anxiety to this day just yeah. thinking about that or just because that was yeah growing up like that and that constant state of fear of hell is yeah it can definitely impact your your consciousness but that's interesting you say like the terrorist attack thing because that kind of ties back into this where it's this if you tap into the cultural zeitgeist I wonder if you would see those impressions in that culture's nightmare, like collectively. So like you, obviously a terrorist attack is a very real thing today in the U S which is sad, but I wonder if, yeah, if other people also share those same nightmares because it's so ingrained in our culture that it's something we're realistically afraid of and right. our, all of our unconscious minds are telling us that this is a terrifying thing the same way where, you know, after a terrifying horror movie comes out and shocks the nation, is that also being impressed on our unconscious to some degree? Yeah, and I almost wonder if 
the things that are real to us are more impactful than the th- you know the things that we consume that are just media or just because like whenever I watch even to this day like I watch Barbarian I don't know if you've seen that dude, one dude I love that movie dude that was a great movie so one good. of the, one of the creepiest movies I've seen in a while yeah and you know during it i'm like this is this is pretty terrifying like this whole concept and and afterwards i was like i don't know if how i'm gonna sleep tonight after watching this yeah. but but i was i slept like a baby oh after, did you yeah i was like totally fine like you know, talk about an old hag that woman deep down in yeah there. oh my Jesus. god yeah wouldn't yeah. want her want to meet her in my dreams that's i sure. died like when they you know they go through the door uh, i don't want to spoil too much if you haven't seen it but the, you know they go through the door yeah. and then there's the second door i was just i was almost laughing because i was like that's so terrifying but also so hilarious in like a knowing the the tropes of like a horror movie yeah They're like ooh, the creepy basement but no we'll, we'll add another fucking layer to that I, I love that movie if you haven't seen that movie you should go check it out so good yeah one of the better ones i've seen in recent years definitely but yeah no i like that idea of just i don't know but like what's on our minds it's kind of i think when you when you when many of us watch horror content we're able to like discern that this is not real right we're like our brains are telling us you know telling ourselves that you know this is hollywood this is just a movie this didn't really happen and what what i found too that impact me and i think this is why they do it oftentimes is when at the beginning of horror movies they'll do this is based on a true story and yeah. i always wonder i'm like it's really not it's like, kind of it's a tactic loose. Yeah. but i feel like they do that to like trick your mind into thinking that what you're about to watch actually happened right like, like i'll never forget watching the strangers for the first time when i was oh, younger it's that like the, another one of my favorites i that was with uh what's her face is that the one where they're in the cabin or no Am I thinking of a different one? Yeah, they're they're in a they're in a cabin. Is it, is it Liv Tyler? Yeah, Liv yeah, Tyler. Okay. Yeah, Liv Tyler's yeah. in that one. And wow, oh, what's the dude in that one? Uh, I can't remember. He's it's another well known actor, but it's been Scott years. Speedman. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, but that one, I, I think, because and, and what's funny is that that is just barely like the yeah, plot, yeah. like it, like the whole movie is completely made up, but it's loosely based on the Keddy Cabin murders. Yeah. Um which were just brutal unsolved murders that happened. And there's really not a lot of similarities between that case and the movie itself, yeah, but it just a lot of creative liberties. Totally. Movie, yeah. yeah. I mean, something about masked people like, yeah, just, it's really good. Just gets you. Like, yeah. I, Oh man, I always think of Mike Myers classic, but yeah, that mask, it's the William Shatner, but they just kind of like yeah. made the eyes and they right. made it pale and stuff. And it looks terrifying. Just a very simple mask. But I also thought of a last movie, swear to God, but you tied into like how these movies want us to make it like, they want us to believe it's real. Yeah. At least to some degree. Right. Mm-hmm. But man, remember, I don't know. I'm, I'm old enough to remember when I first saw a uh, Blair Witch Project when I thought it was real. I didn't know I was in middle school and I was like, dude, no, I this thought it was is real, real. Too. And they had like the, the commentary and all the bonus documentary stuff of like, they're interviewing like the girl's brother and her priest and stuff. I was like, dude, this is real. <laughs> what? But obviously it was all a farce, but you could get away with it. But why do you then. think it did so well? Is because it's, it felt real. Yeah. I think it's like the found footage. It's just like the way it was shot and everything. It's really convinced people that I'm it surprised was there real. haven't been more movies like that, like shot from that angle because shooting in the sort of that first person perspective, I think just made it, it made you feel like you were there. Yeah. Cause sometimes I feel like I'm watching these horror movies and it's like, I'm watching from this exterior perspective and I'm not actually in sort of in the movie. Yeah. And those don't scare me as much as the ones where they do a lot of first person shots where yeah. you're like in there yeah, with them. Right. No, I love found footage, like first person stuff. I think it, maybe it got overplayed or something. And cause I, I think maybe the last big one, once it got mainstream, cause what was the, what was that movie? The alien comes a huge alien in New York. Uh, JJ Abrams Cloverfield. Oh, Cloverfield. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. like, I feel like that was maybe the, the end of the found footage era possibly just because it had kind of climaxed there 
fun movie. I I love that movie, but yeah, that that the real feeling, yeah, it definitely plays into our nightmares a lot, and I think that all ties together back into sleep paralysis to some degree, where what we're most afraid of is projected. But also, with that said, sometimes it is very real when people are sleeping. They have a sleep paralysis episode. Like there was a case where this one woman, she felt like she was held down by a sleep paralysis demon. And this demon was stabbing her repeatedly in the stomach. She couldn't do anything. She just oh my God. to lay there. But once she woke up, she noticed that the pain was still there. There was no blood or anything like she had been stabbed. She had this just incredible pain in her stomach. So they rushed her to the hospital and the doctors found out that her appendix had burst. Wow, that's really interesting. So it's like, is, is your it... physical ailments yeah. affect that? Like, affect your experience? And it's like, is it is it playing... Which way is it playing into? Is it is it the actual paralysis demon had done something to you? Or was it there was something actually physically happening to your body that then you were projecting that into your paralysis wow, nightmare? That's, that's really wild to think about. Yeah. But another example of the cultural fear-based paralysis demons is things like uh, ufo sightings sometimes people experience sleep paralysis alien abductions and i wonder if that also plays into it if well are they being abducted what's going on there or if it's if we're seeing a cultural uptick in ufos like now for example where ufos were on people's minds for like several weeks you know even still now since those congressional hearings so I wonder if we'd see an uptick in sleep paralysis, alien abductions or something along yeah. those lines. Yeah, know? that's a good point. I wonder about that too. Or if, yeah, more people have experiences with alien abductions. That's wild. Because some people even believe that the hat man or other sleep paralysis demons might actually be extraterrestrials or interdimensional beings. And in recent years, there's been a massive surge in abduction reports. Some claim they were subjected to medical experiences after being levitated during paralysis. And similar to other sleep paralysis experiences, the sleeper senses a presence while they're lying down. They're helpless and can't move while the entities poke and prod them. Strange medical instruments. A 1992 report suggested that nearly 4 million Americans reported abduction experiences. That is a staggering number. Crazy amount. It might not be a coincidence that shadow people are also seen during abductions. Shadow people are figures you often see out of the corner of your eye. You aren't sure what you saw. It might have looked like a person or your mind was perhaps filling in the gaps. Rarely you'll ever get a good look at them. They're pitch black with a rough humanoid form. They almost look like they're made from the shadows themselves. Some are seen as the size of a human adult. Others are short like children. Some are solid black and others are smoky. They're believed to be spirits or demons, but other theories think they might be aliens or possibly native interdimensional beings they live on the earth walk among us but they're able to slip in and out of different dimensions which just goes hand in hand with the whole discussion we had last week that's what i was thinking yeah the this idea of interdimensional beings cohabiting the this planet with us and you know they just are able to slip in into you know into different and maybe why they appear to us in this shadowy form is just they you know they either aren't able to you know manifest themselves in the physical reality because perhaps right. they're they're made of a different you know they're not carbon-based life forms there's there's infinite number of reasons why they may not be able to fully show themselves in their native form but you know they're roughly trying to appear as a, a human one theory suggests that these beings might actually be your own dead spirit watching your life play back like a movie at the moment of your death that's wild to think about like what if we we're all just watching ourselves and we're already dead and you had said that about the dmt yeah. release right it's right. like you watch your life back very quickly you know others think they're here to abduct us for some unknown reason and those who are abducted might experience interdimensional travel which might take an incredible toll on the human mind if you're lucky the paralysis will end before the shadow person can snatch you right out of your bed little side note but it kind of reminds me of the chris bledsoe episode yeah. remember that that second kind of when he he met the woman in the forest but he woke up and he saw the shadow figures moving out of his room and that's what he followed him and i think even daniel said oh that sounded like a dream like yeah a cool dream state so i kind of thought of him when i thought of the shadow people and his alien abduction experience but 
Another aspect of sleep paralysis that ties into all this is you actually touched on it a little bit. It's your mind projecting your own body or astral travel, astral projection. Some might just simply call it an out-of-body experience. But um, what I'm about to get into is mostly an opinion article by two neuroscientists. And I think I touch a little bit on, on some other stuff, but we'll drop more sources below in the video. Uh, when sleep paralysis kicks in, many have experienced some type of out-of-body experience. Our own perception of our body is disturbed during sleep paralysis because we're aware, but we can't move. We might project our own figure somewhere else in the room, which is what I was talking about, the phantom limb. You know, people experience that. They could still kind of sense their arm, even though it's not, it might not be there anymore. So we just might be projecting our own figure. So what's called the mirror neuron system or MNS allows you to detach yourself from your own body. You can essentially see the world from a virtual point of view, like across the room, you mm -hmm. would be basically seeing everything else. Similar to like astral projecting, it sounds like. Exactly. It's a, it's a lot on board with the same thing. In the article's own words, you get, quote, a feeling that you are out there looking at someone else's actions while at the same time being fully anchored here and now in your own body. So this makes it hard to distinguish whether are you the person in the bed or are you the other entity across the room also looking at it. Blows my mind to think about that. I've Have you ever had an out-of-body experience or anything like that? No, I wish I had, though. Yeah, Daniel. I pray for one every night. I'm like, please <laughs> take me, take out, of me out, like rip me out of my body. I just want to be like <laughs> floating around, looking at myself, laying in bed. Seriously, like I'm dead serious. I really want an out of body experience. My my friend, uh, I haven't talked to him in a while, but he used to get sleep paralysis and he never had demons, but he would have out of body experiences. He would just see, he would actually be up at the ceiling, just straight looking down at himself just not being able to move, it would freak him out until it would pass after a few minutes. But uh -huh. when you're going through sleep paralysis, your brain is essentially firing off these signals to move, but nothing happens. So your literal sense of self is becoming distorted. So your brain is just struggling to try and fill in the gaps. And this is why it might be projecting outside of yourself. And it might also be why you're witnessing a human shape that's possibly moving in strange ways huh. it's like your brain is basically like move 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 but since you can't your brain's just showing someone moving another figure in the room moving. do you think that the demonic part this this entity visiting you could have something to do with you know as you're you know you're waking up you're you're feeling yourself you know i can't move i'm stuck here and do you think that it's like your your brain going into that fight or flight response and maybe that fight or flight response because that is such a strong it's one of the strongest i guess reactions your your brain has to you know the situation that you're in that that is powerful enough that it's actually the thing that's manifesting that that entity i would because it's like that fight or flight response is like peak fear right it's like yeah you go into that when you're like if I don't do something right now, I will die. Yeah. And so is that what's triggering this this demonic entity? Like your worst fear showing up. I'm totally on board with that. That makes a lot of sense. And it also explains the terror and you just go into that survival mode. Yeah. There, there's got to be something going on with that because it seems like, I mean, based on people's experiences, it's one of the most terrifying things you can actually go through as a human being. And so there's your brain is obviously worried that you might die in this situation. I mean, especially if your, your heart rate is going crazy and your breathing is um, struggling, it would just make sense to me that perhaps there's something triggered there, you know, and I wonder if there's like a little DMT release, you know, right, that's yeah. happening and causing these intense hallucinations to happen. And, you know, if you're, there's gotta be something chemically going on in the brain. And like I said, the neuroscience, all the neural transmitters they were talking about, it was kind of going above my head. Yeah. I yeah. just, I, I wasn't equipped to dive into all the different chemicals and everything firing off. 
Um, but if, yeah, if you're interested, I mean, it's out there. They do have a lot of studies on sleep, sleep paralysis, what, what's actually firing off in the brain during dreams and stuff like that. I, I was struggling to comprehend <laughs> some of the deeper stuff. But the last thing about the astral projection or out-of-body experience is uh, even the Mongolians called sleep paralysis kar durak. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing that, which means roughly to be pressed by the black. And they even believe that sleep paralysis demons were actually just the sleepers like dark side that was personified. Yeah. So it was just you. That's an interesting thought. Yeah. That was the other thing I was just thinking about too. I'm like, what if the demons are your inner demon? I could I would manifest it in a physical form. Yeah. You know, everybody's got this sort of dark side to them or this, you know they've got everybody's got issues everybody's got fears and everybody's got baggage and has made mistakes and done things that they're not proud of and so is it a manifestation of all those things yeah in a form that you recognize like i go back to everybody seeing you know everybody's kind of seeing similar things but also seeing things unique to their own personal experiences in life like daniel with 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 his sleep paralysis demon versus others are um, you know, seeing dead family members and things like that. Is there like some unresolved trauma there from their real past with those people or, you know, just past experiences in your own life where you've, you've made mistakes or done bad things. And that is, you know, it's a way of alerting you to, Hey, you know, you got some inner demons. You got to, you got to deal fix with this. Yeah. And no, you're, I, you're not getting the cue. So we're going to just put it right in front yeah, of you. Yeah. Here. <laughs> you got to deal with it, man. There's no escaping this one. Yeah. No, I like that idea. I mean, honestly, a lot of my nightmares, I think, are, do stem from anxiety, guilt, like stress, yeah, stuff those like dark that, things. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I would agree. So now that we all know all the horrific things that can happen to you while you're asleep, you're probably wondering, well, Josh, Austin, how do I avoid these nasty sleep paralysis and the demons that come with it? Well, bad news. There's no cure. Sorry, guys. But there is a list of things that, you know, if you go and Google it, the, you know, all the, the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic will, you know, they have to suggest something. And just be like, well, you're fucked. You're screwed, yeah. You know, just try to write it out. <laughs> but it really, it's, it's all just basic suggestions. Like, get a healthy sleep schedule improve your bedtime routine don't sleep on your back because snoring or sleep apnea can cause breathing issues talk to your doctor about any medications that you're taking that might affect your sleep which that, that's another big thing too is like there are medications that affect your sleeping and your dream states yeah for sure. the first thing i thought of i know ambien can yeah. really screw oh, people yeah. up and that's I, I think sleepwalking cases like the crazy ones are also caused by ambien me personally i know just like taking cbd or or you know, smoking weed before bed, I generally have more vivid dreams oh, really? when I take it. Yeah. Versus when I don't. And sometimes it's in more of a bad way too. Like it's more stressful dreams generally versus when, and, and it's weird too. Cause when I do, like I usually take CBD every night before I go to bed and the nights that I don't, I usually don't remember my dreams. I know that I did dream cause there's like a faint hint of, of what I may have been dreaming about. But when I do take CBD and I do have these vivid dreams, I'm often able to like wake up and be like, oh wow, that was crazy. And I kind of really remember what what I dreamed about. And I've noticed that those dreams are are more real. Like they're they usually involve real people as opposed to dreams where I'm just completely, you know, sober going to bed are more rooted in like fantasy world which is very weird and i don't know if there's any connection there and i I do think that obviously our brains are very chemically you know complex so i do think that substances and the chemicals in these substances absolutely play into your dream state yeah i mean it only makes sense right yeah definitely and with that said the um i know if you can remember your dreams or not people get worried because they're like i i don't dream I can't remember any of my dreams and whatnot. It's not also, it's not necessarily the case. I read one theory that it's basically saying when you're shot out of REM, that's when you can remember your dreams, which isn't always the healthiest sleep to get. You're usually being 
oh, wake, yeah. woken up by something, you know? So most of the time you are dreaming, you just don't remember it because you're slowly, think of it like Inception, how you're getting like yeah. snapped out of the levels. Yeah. So like, it just means you're getting a healthy night's rest. And that's, because a lot of the times I'm like, did I dream that? I felt like I didn't dream at all, but really it just means you're, it's, it was kind of so long you ago. You completed the full cycle. Yeah. And I've noticed that those nights where, you know, I don't necessarily remember it or it feels like I just like blacked out and then I'm awake again. Yeah. That those are the nights I get the best sleep. Definitely. Yep. Versus the nights that I am intensely <laughs> dreaming. I'm yeah. like waking up like, oh God, I feel yeah. like I didn't even sleep last night. Yeah, exactly. Which is very, yeah, that concept in itself is very interesting. And, and obviously like everybody's different and, you know, we all deal with anxiety, stress, and some of us deal with depression and PTSD and if those things are, if you're not dealing with those things and, and attempting to, to remedy them, like obviously those are going to play a huge factor. Cause I, I look back at my night terrors and stuff and I do that period of my life. And I'm sure with your experiences, Daniel, like if you think back on, well, was there stuff going on during that time that could have, could have played into it? Especially for me, it was like tons of stress. It was like one of the most stressful times of my life, tons of anxiety. And I, I do think that those, play heavily into you know your your dream state and and sleeping in general versus like now i feel like in and in recent years i'm sleeping better than ever and i think for the most part my mental health is in a, in a really good place so it's good i think that's part of it but yeah and i mean it's easier said than done yeah you know absolutely but, everybody and we have our days too right sometimes yeah. it's like a mess and like you are today <laughs> just <laughs> kidding but <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's your, your physical state, your mental health is, is extremely important. You know, exercising is always good for the body. Releasing those endorphins is always, always a good thing. Meditating before going to bed, doing deep breathing exercises or just de-stressing. Like the last thing you want to do is like get yourself all hyped up before you go to bed or like watch some intense movie and then like, all right, good night. And then yeah. like try it in your brains. just like, re you know, processing everything you just watched. Like my my routine is like pretty much every night i'm listening to i i love ambient music you know no lyrics just like or you know listening to soundtracks just very like soothing music that kind of just allows my mind to, to relax and just focusing on taking deep breaths and and i mean i'm out like that like yeah it's it's super easy for me to fall asleep it sounds like last night was pretty rough for you last did you try to rough. do anything to what oh, was your routine last night and laid there and just tried to suck it up and go to bed. I just What's your uh, bedtime routine? Take us through it. Yeah, my bed. Okay. What time do you go I, to bed? I usually, I'm in bed. Well, last night I was in bed 11. I try to be in bed 12 at the latest. Um, and usually I have no problem falling asleep. It's never really been an issue. But last night, I think most of the times when I'm kept up, it's because I ate some shit before bed or something. Yeah. And my digestive system is, I've noticed that my digestion actually plays a lot into where my head goes, especially when I dream too. Because I was talking about cheese and stuff, eating cheese before bed to get vivid dreams. Supposedly they are connected. The, the gut and the brain? The gut and oh, the brain, yeah. 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 So I didn't really realize that. Sometimes I think it's, I just didn't eat right. Um but no, I usually try and wind down. I read about a half hour to an hour before oh, that's a good going way to, to bed. Yeah. Go to sleep. <laughs> and I always like reading because it kind of sets my mind on one track where normally when my day's going, sometimes I can get distracted. There's just a lot more going on. There's stimulation yeah. happening everywhere. Whereas yeah. a book, you get that one track mind going and then kind of funnels everything down to just lights out, right? Hey. Hey. <laughs> But that's usually my, how I wind down. Do you eat it, dinner pretty late? Uh, some days, yes, because I fast like during the day. Oh, so okay. I won't. So you I, have your window later in the day? Yeah. So sometimes I won't eat like my first meal until 3 p.m. And okay. then, so it's like by dinner, I'm maybe it's not like eight or nine for, for dinner or oh, something wow. like that. Yeah. I noticed when, ever since I've had a, had a kid, that getting my routine in a better place especially when it comes to eating dinner like i eat dinner at like 5 36 now nice. every night and so by the time i go to bed at like 9 10 o'clock i'm like you know digested i'm like feeling pretty good and i've noticed that it's really helped my quality of sleep versus prior to having a kid i was kind of like you yeah, i'd be like up till 12 1 in the morning we'd eat dinner at like 10 o'clock at night and and 
not eating the best of food either and i think that plays into it as well i think your digestion no. does have a lot to do with it i mean nobody likes falling to trying to fall asleep and you got freaking indis- indigestion or like heartburn going on yeah, like that's God. terrible like yeah, you're I, laying in bed you're like oh i think it was like 10 30 i ate chips and guacamole <laughs> probably not the best thing to eat before bed but it sounds like i just i need to have a kid yeah it's not, kid myself. is the remedy to everything right <laughs> it'll it'll solve all your problems all right who's gonna who's gonna be the the lucky uh yeah winner who, who wants to have my child so i can get my <laughs> sleep schedule on board <laughs> what about you daniel what's your what's your sleep routine like uh, and do you experience sleep paralysis still or is it kind of gone away so i don't experience sleep paralysis anymore and i tried to think back to the last time i had you know that experience and what i think switched it in my brain was the first time i got a concussion oh interesting i got a con- the first time i got a concussion was around like 22 years old and ever since that i've had n- honestly no trouble sleeping and oh. no sleep paralysis demons at all so i think i just got it knocked out of my head <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> that, that screw that was loose got <laughs> we just knocked that knocked screw back, back in <laughs> back into place there dean was Button up in there up. he got hit he was like oh, i don't want to be here anymore um, <laughs> back in the cage you go man <laughs> But my night, my nighttime routine is kind of similar to Austin. I probably I go to bed around like eleven o'clock midnight. I eat probably around like nine nine thirty. Um, then I have a late snack around like right before I go to bed. Um, I am I am bad with the screens. I do get blue light I was up until say, about like thirty minutes before I go to bed. That makes it really hard to go to bed. It does. It's hard to wind down from screens. It yeah. really is. But I do make it a habit while I'm like uh, brushing my teeth, flossing, all that stuff to stretch while I'm doing that and do deep breathing. So I'm relaxing my body and I find that if I relax my body, my mind will follow. Oh, and then that's a good tip. Yeah. That usually helps me fall asleep within 10, 15 minutes of lying down. So I don't really have any trouble falling asleep or And you can stay asleep. asleep. Like yeah. neither of you have like waking up constantly throughout the night and no, having trouble falling back to it, sleep. This is like a bad week maybe, but no, most of the time I can stay asleep. That's good though. I need to stretch and do deep breathing. I think that would help a lot before bed. Weirdly enough, I actually get really bad sleep when I take melatonin. You were yeah. talking about Dude, CBD, same. but whenever I take melatonin, I have weird, weird dreams that are honestly pretty dark. And then I can't, I, I fall asleep really fast, but I can't stay asleep and I always overheat. It's, it's weird. Yeah, the melatonin fucks me up in a way. I get a restless leg syndrome. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I guess that I looked it up and that's, I guess that's a thing with melatonin, but man, it is, I refuse to do melatonin anymore because of that. I'd rather just take the bad night's sleep. Yeah, honestly. You know? Yeah, melatonin. I've I've had nothing but bad experiences with melatonin too, yeah. especially in high doses of it. Like nice. maybe a little bit, it might be all right if it's just like a little bit in something else, or it's a blend of something. Yeah, like versus, a milligram. Yeah, versus like you know just taking you know a bunch of melatonin pills before you go to bed. Like, yeah, no thanks. And I've noticed that even taking sleep aid. You know, I've taken sleep aid from time to time for when I really need like especially before traveling and big trips. Sometimes I get that like travel anxiety going the night before. And I'm like, it's kind of, you know, my mind's just like, I know I got to get up early the next day. Yeah. And I'm like, gosh, I need to like make sure I get myself to sleep. And, but when I do that, I'm just groggy as shit the next morning, yeah, and I'm like, oh, why'd I do that? Like, I don't even feel rested versus if I just, you know, try to relax myself, you know, well, CBD, CBD is great for, for sleep. Yeah, I should try that. I think I still have some of the, your your guys stuff yeah you should try that yeah our love wellness.com we've got a, a sleep blend too uh cbn and cbd which is another cannabinoid that is shown to almost act as like a sedative uh for the body and it's just it's all natural too no melatonin none of that and take take one or two of those gummies and you honestly sleep really well you should check that out but yeah so that is uh that is sleep paralysis and the demons that come with it let us know your thoughts on this. I'd love to hear your stories down in the comments or you know, if you're, you're listening uh, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, you can always hit us up on Instagram, uh, we're on TikTok, we're on all the platforms. And, and lastly, I just want to shout out you know, all of our new members. Thank you for, for joining the Lights Out Low Lives Club. Uh, if you'd like to become a member and take advantage of all the cool perks we got going on, just head over to YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash lights out and hit that join button and join the exclusive club but that will be it for us today and you know try to sleep tight tonight hopefully some of you aren't listening to us as you're falling asleep i know a lot of you do listen to the show while you're falling asleep but hopefully uh your sleep paralysis demon uh lets you lets you have a, a restful night but 
we'll see you guys next week with another one until then lights out everybody